computational thinking is about problem solving, and problem solving involves tools. I want to demonstrate to you how interaction between tools and problems can happen in case of carpentry. I like to take this piece of wood and attach it to this other piece of wood. I have this tool, a hammer, and a screw. Let's observe. working very well. The screw is starting to buckle and this isn't really a, neither a good process nor is the result very satisfying. What's going on? This is a question of affordance. Clearly in this particular case because we had a screw we would have been better off using a screwdriver or even better a power drill. What's going on? It's the question of affordances. We need to understand the relationships between tools and problems and tools and problems can be aligned well or not so well in this particular case this didn't work out very well but we had a very good understanding of the affordance we knew that probably the hammer isn't going to be a great tool to deal with the screw but in the case of software in the case of programming in the case of computational thinking often we use tools and we do not realize what is going on are we using a hammer and are we smacking a screw is this working out well, or would there be a tool that would make it much easier for us to solve the problem? Now, we are not actually interested to solve the challenge of connecting two pieces of wood, but there's a computational thinking challenge that emerged over time, working with thousands of K-12 teachers and students around the world trying to tackle it. We found it very interesting because it revealed what we call the affordance of computational thinking tools. The hourglass challenge is intentionally left vague and states, build an hourglass, sand should fall from an upper area of a vessel to the lower area and accumulate there. Frankly, we expected to see hourglass simulations, but when we analyzed the results from 54 pre-service elementary school teachers participating in the challenge, we found, for instance, that nobody using scratch turned a simulation in and many got quite frustrated trying to make a simulation. The question is why? Go ahead, take an hour or so to think about how you would solve the challenge using your favorite programming tool of choice. If you are watching the YouTube version of this video, please add your comments to the bottom of this video. If you have a working but also a non-working version, please share your project as a link. Tell us how you did solve the challenge, or if you failed, when and why did you give up? One hour later. Let's look at an example solution to the hourglass challenge using ancient cubes. I'm following the process of computational thinking suggested by Wing, having abstraction automation and analysis. Abstraction consists of picking up the kind of objects that we need, in this case, glass and sand particles, to draw a world that could look like this. I'm now going to do the automation by creating a rule. The rule could be a sand particle like this one here. If it's empty below it, then I move down. So let's run this. So far, so good. Now let's pick many, many more pieces of sand like this. We can see that they're stuck. I can move now to analysis, look at this one particle up here and I can see, well, it doesn't see empty below it. So if not empty below it, then I'm not gonna move down. So I need a new rule. I can copy this one. I need two more rules to say I could go diagonally left or right. So if I go to the left, if it's empty there, which is the case right now, as we can see, then I move diagonally to the left. If it's the diagonally empty to the right, then I move to the right. So let's run this. And of course, we can have more sand particles added.
And that's our sand clock. According to Don Norman, the affordance of a thing refers to the perceived and actual properties of the thing, primarily those fundamental properties that determine just how the thing could possibly be used. A door handle to open doors is a positive example of an affordance because its function can be readily perceived. A book to stop a door, on the other hand, is not an affordance. While one can use a book as a door stop, this is not a readily perceived property. So what are the specific affordances that allow us to complete the hourglass challenge? Affordance number one is class-based versus prototype-based object orientation. So this can make a big difference if you have many objects, like in this case, we have about already a thousand sand particles. If I want to change their behavior from moving down to moving up, I can do that because I have a class instance representation. So I can change the rules. I simply say, no, no, let's move up. And then we run it and we get the reverse. Affordance number two is the ability to design structured worlds with many objects. If I create complex games and, and simulations, I need to have many kinds of objects interacting with, with each other. And if I would have to copy them and program them individually, using a prototype instance model, this would be very tedious. So in this particular case, I can simply take any object I want, draw a, a new kind of scene, like a bowl, a big bowl, small bowl, here maybe another one, here's another one. And we draw some objects, here's, I left a hole, I put some sand particles, I can draw some individual ones like this, or a complete group of particles. This really helps me to create complex worlds and simulations. Affordance number three is the parsable world structure. It is quite difficult for this particular particle to know what it's supposed to do in the behavior. We see that it can't go down vertically, but it could go down diagonally left with a 50% chance or diagonally to the right. But if you do not have a structured world, and if you do not have such query function, such if it's empty, you would have to implement this kind of functionality using collision, which would be very difficult. Because how do I know that an object isn't there if I'm not already falling onto it? Back to our example, the green line suggests affordances of tools. Hammers are good to drive in nails. Screwdrivers are good to tighten or loosen screws. Red lines suggest a mismatch between these tools and problems. Programming tools, or let's call them computational thinking tools, also have affordances. These affordances are independent of the type of programming language. Just as clearly not all textual programming languages are alike, neither are blocks-based programming languages. Provided that most students do not just want to write sequences, loops, and if statements, but rather they would like to create interesting artifacts such as games, simulations, animations, stories, or robots, affordances play an essential role. Affordances could make the difference between simple and elegant solutions versus complex and hard to understand solutions. Let's talk about computer science didactics. There is a deeply rooted confusion about didactics, which is that students, especially beginners, should not have f be further frustrated with the already difficult concept of programming through ill-aligned tools and problems. This is how we end up having students create line drawings with logo, animations with scratch, and 3D games and simulations with agent cubes. In other words, with great intentions, teachers keep students on the green lines. However, just as people assembling IKEA furniture will not automatically turn them into great architects, students following the green line 
will not actually experience affordances. To make affordances visible, students should be engaged into activities following red lines, even if the learning process will include likely frustration. Scaffolded through learning designs such as productive failure, students are likely to learn a lot about computational thinking by recognizing affordances of tools. Affordances should be part of computational thinking education. Good pedagogy should not be limited to activities suggested by the green lines, but should include red line activities. In other words, students should be encouraged to smacking screws with hammers in order to experience the presence or lack of importance affordances. This is Ashok Basava Patna in New York. And this is Alexander Repenning in Switzerland. And this is our paper, Smacking Screws with Hammers. 54 pre-service elementary school teachers were given the hourglass challenge. They were already trained in computational thinking and had been using tools such as Agent Cubes, Scratch and Logo. These teachers were familiar with the computational thinking process implied by Wing, consisting of abstraction, automation and analysis. Early on, Seymour Papert used the notion of computational thinking to talk about the use of programming to facilitate what he called explicative learning processes. In the context of mathematics, he talked about a bidirectional learning process combining learn to program with program to learn. When analyzing the solutions to the hourglass challenge, we categorized the project submitted into five clusters, E1 to E5, according to their degree of explicativeness. A low degree of explicativeness resulting from projects that either just drew a static picture or an animation may still fulfill the learn to program goal of CT, but are not likely to contribute much towards the program to learn aspect of computational thinking. An animation, for instance, may simply reaffirm existing misconceptions. Simulations, in contrast, try to model causality with the potentially surprising results. The three submissions in the E1 category represent the least explicative of all the submissions. In this category, students represented the hourglass as a static picture. Here we see an hourglass drawing where the grains of sand don't move but do change colors with each key press. This category of project is afforded by the ability to easily draw sprites in Scratch. Submissions in the E2 category represent particle cluster animations, which visualize sand falling through the hourglass by creating a flipbook of pictures that are cycled through over a period of time. This is afforded by the ability for sprites to have an ordered sequence of costumes in Scratch. On the right we see the seven costumes and the code, including the next costume puzzle piece that enables this type of animation. The 23 submissions in the E3 Multipath Particle Animation category represent each grain of sand as an individual sprite that moves in a prescribed path from beginning to end. So movement is fully choreographed and there is no collision detection between two grains of sand or sand in the hourglass. This choreographed movement is afforded by the glide puzzle piece which allows a sprite to go from one position to another over a period of time. Representing each grain of sand as an individual sprite is enabled by the ability to clone a sprite, which also duplicates the code, and then modify the code to change the path of the sprite. One submission fell into E4, the Conditional Particle Animation category. This submission programmed the sand colliding with the sides of the hourglass through a clever mechanism. Namely, it is possible to detect sprites collisions with a particular color in Scratch. So by coloring the left, right, and middle of the hourglass differently, one can detect which part of the hourglass the sand is colliding with and change the trajectory accordingly. The trajectory post hourglass collision are hard coded to match the angle of the drawn hourglass side, meaning the shape of the hourglass can't change without modifying code but the sand configurations could change a bit with the hourglass collisions still being preserved. Given the scratch environment, 
This solution is possible. However, most students decided not to go down this path. Furthermore, as programmed, this solution does not try to preserve collisions between grains of sand. Seymour Papert believed that an explicative process of programming allows one to make the leap from learning to program to also programming to learn. For example, the E5 particle simulation category enables each grain of sand to collide with each other and the sides of the hourglass. By expressing our solution as a particle simulation, we can experiment on our creation by, for example, trying different hourglass shapes and different configurations of sand to enhance our understanding. Furthermore, this allows us to do the analysis step of computational thinking by enabling us to validate our simulation to determine where our abstraction and our solution expression may have fallen short for our given problem domain. Finally, this can inform our next iteration through the computational thinking cycle. Nobody was able to create a particle simulation in Scratch for this particular challenge. Of course, there are other challenges in which Scratch would be a perfectly matched tool. That's not the point of this. The key takeaway is that understanding tool affordances and the relation to the problem domain is a crucial step in the computational thinking process and should be explicitly taught to students. The results of E5 make that abundantly clear. This graph summarizes the submission results for the Hourglass Challenge in Scratch. On the x-axis, we have potential to be explicative, and on the y-axis, the number of submissions in each category. Most of the submissions were in the Particle Cluster or Multipath Particle Animation category. As teachers, we tend to give novice programmers a task well-matched to a given tool. However, the intuition one might have when creating a well-matched challenge for a specific tool is the same intuition a student must have in order to express their ideas computationally and create explicative artifacts. One possible way to give students this intuition is to intentionally give them a problem mismatched to a given tool. By allowing students to smack screws with hammers, they experience this mismatch and the role of affordances in the computational thinking process. Up to this point, students had only created simulations of the hourglass. However, most students ended up turning in an hourglass animation. In this respect, the data indicates that students experienced how different affordances can deeply impact what you're able to create, which is an important part of the computational thinking process. What I thought was really interesting was the choice of programming tool determines the artifact, and this choice occurs before the first line of code is ever written. Um, so in the case of the Hourglass Challenge, for example, uh, in Scratch, it led to students creating this multi-path particle animation. Um, and so the implications of the tool are very significant. I think you're definitely right. I think, you know, and that's what I would call the affordances. And so, that's even the first step of computational thinking, you know, abstractions, right? If you only look through the lens of programming abstraction, then you only see the idea of functions and methods. But if you look through the lens of computational thinking, we actually need to think about the objects that we're dealing with and the interactions. And that's a completely different viewpoint, but it does determine what kind of projects we, we can do. And solving a problem results in a simple and elegant program with one tool, but it's nearly impossible with another, the difference can likely be explained through the affordances of these programming tools. Understanding affordances should be part of computational thinking education. The hourglass challenge can make affordances visible by forcing learners to, metaphorically speaking, smack a screw with a hammer in order to experience the presence or lack of important affordances.